I can just uh, have your attention. Um, again, you're, I know you're all so delighted to, to be in person and uh, in chatting uh, with your colleagues. Um, but I want to just uh, introduce our lunchtime speakers and panelists. So up here, I'm standing in front of them. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Deborah Dirks, um, who's the chair uh, at UT Southwestern and uh, uh, past SAM board member and prominent researcher, investigator, and academician in our field. Um, and Dr. Richard Wolf, um, who is the chair at Beth Israel Deaconess um, uh, in Boston and also the uh, associate professor um, uh, at Harvard and also SAM uh, board member who served very capably. Um, and they're going to present a session on innovation. And I'm just going to hand it over to them. I could give you much longer bios, but I, they, they're so modest they wouldn't want me to anyways. Thank you, Brian. And so we're going to get going. And we really hope this is interactive because if it's not, there's some people in this room I know very well, and I will share stories. So um, please talk up, or I will select some chosen few. <laughs> All right. So what we thought we'd do is actually go ahead with three cases. We'll see how many we get through, and sort of let everybody here try to deal with them and figure out how you're going to innovate your way as a chair out of a solution, out of this problem. So we thought we'd do something old, something sort of blue, and something new. So we'll start with the old one since we all had to go through this, but let's put ourselves back at the beginning of the pandemic and look at this problem. So a new pandemic is breaching uh, in other parts of the country. It's aerosolized and carry, carries a mortality rate ranging from one to 2%. Tests confirm that the infection takes about two to three days so in other words, when you test it, you're not going to know right away. There's no rapid COVID swab. Uh, infection control is concerned about the shortage of N95 masks and has issued 10-day quarantine rules for any provider that's exposed within six feet for more than four minutes without a mask. The next day is uh, your M&M conference. Um, so what, what do you guys think or what are the moves you should start making literally uh, at, this at this point? Resignation is a possibility. Right, exactly. <laughs> no, always, always delegate so you have somebody to blame. Excellent move. Yes, Mary. Just to kind of repeat what Mary said for those in the back, one of the first, if you aren't in the middle of the pandemic it, at the beginning, you actually have the luxury of learning from others' experiences, right? So maybe one of the first things you do is reach out to somebody else who's already addressed this and figured out what worked for them. Right, so I would, and expanding on that, so a great move is called Intel gathering before you even start to innovate. Right. Find out what's out there. Never invent something if you can steal it. Yep. Uh, and you know, the, that's really a principle. And we mentioned going to others who have experienced it. Um, ID is just basically creating an impossible situation. I would pick up the phone with ID and say, what the hell are you doing? And then if you're going to impose this, give me some ideas or what am I dealing with? So I ask that, so you go to ID or do you go to the clinical leadership and say, look, it, if we do this, this is what will happen? Yeah. I, I think the answer to that one is in all of the above. Yep. Yep. You make yourself as annoying to possible as many people as possible. <laughs> so that you're able at this point to begin a dialogue so that people are aware of the very particular problem. Because at your M&M conference the next day, you may literally take out half your faculty in one swoop and literally be unable to cover emergency care. Yep. Yes, Will. I think it's a great point, right? So you have to go to ID and learn what their perspective is. You know, I think from the last pandemic, I think many of us learned that the 
prevention of illness, right, and spread was their primary priority. And frankly, from at my institution, we're less concerned about the clinical implications of it on the Department of Emergency Medicine if we knocked out half our staff. Yes. So, so I think you bring up more of a question than, than, than a solution, and I'll explain. Yeah, this one we know, because we've just been three, three years of this, but when this case happened, this was like a first. Nobody had seen a pandemic like this since 1918, so you didn't know. So, but, but the answer is your disaster preparedness or your, you know, um, basically controlling committee uh, incident command that they set up is going to be the one that's going to be able to short circuit fast decisions. And I would say the first question you should ask is, are the right people on that committee? Or does emergency medicine have a voice? Because Deb's point is, emergency medicine is looked very often by hospital administration as a problem. If they could figure out a way to shut it down and only do elective, that would be their, their particular dream. So, and again, you have to be sort of have a voice that can make sure that our patient population, the most vulnerable, are protected. Yes, sir. So, you know, a lot of people talk about altering the rules, right? The other thing you can do is use it to your advantage and take out bad actors, right? Because if your doctors who are in day 20 need him to be in the ER to provide their care, mm -hmm. can you get your N95 mask from another source to make him available when he's there, right? Then you're playing with your own rules and you're altering the rules of the ER. Because just because people are at home doesn't mean they can't practice emergency medicine, right? So <coughs> you've already jumped to innovation, which is exactly right. And that's exactly the sort of reflex because you don't have a lot of time to play either. You gather intel, but at the same time, you're trying to think about solutions. And I think with a pandemic, you espouse, you can even carve that out to a principle, which is nobody should be next to another person unless it's absolutely essential for the mission. So anything that can be done remote, anything that can be done through a wall or through a camera, should be done through a camera unless it compromises patient care. And using that paradigm, then you can begin to figure out what is it that we do that really is more harmful rather than helpful in this type of situation. And so, right, can you use virtual, can you use iPads to take histories? How many people really need to do an exam? And should a nurse do it? Should a physician do it? Should you share it so one side doesn't feel that they're being screwed by the other side? Those are all the sort of things then that you have to go out. But it brings up another problem. The minute you're going to start making change, you're going to have to figure out how do I get buy-in? Yeah, so I think one of the things in a leadership course, when you think about innovation, it's being innovative isn't enough. You've got to get every other people to buy into your the value proposition that you're, you're, you're providing them. And that is who do you need to get buy-in from and how do you do it? Right, and they, a part of it is what point, right? You have an idea at day one. Do you go to someone then? Do you try to get, and where do you go? Do you go up, do you go down, do you go lateral? Right, so who are you gonna get buy-in from? Because without buy-in, every innovation will fail. Because there are very few things that we do in the emergency department that only impact us. And so part of it is, who is gonna be your team? And as you go out to that idea, that team, and if you talk about virtual, right? Your IT people are your team. Right, the people that run the Epic, run my chart, do anything that you know. Anybody who gets your virtual platform, they're your team because you're going to need to their help to get access into the hospital itself, right? And so, where's your team and who you're going to get that from? I'd say lawyers are your team too, because you're no longer going to do. Not everyone is going to provide a physical exam. You're going to limit it. So, making sure you're covered and your team's covered, medical legally on that type of innovation is also really important. I'd say also you should decide your style. Right, yep. Uh, there's one style which is the right one, conciliatory, collaborative. 
and there's my style, which is it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. And so it allows you to move rather quickly. But we've skipped over, I think, a very important component of what is in the innovation process or dealing with these types of crisis, which is, you know, your main job as a leader is about communication. Right. Um, if you're worried about this, imagine what it's like if you're a junior faculty member who's hearing about people dying in New York uh, and has no vo feels they have no voice, feels is not sure what is being decided at the top. And so one of the first things you need to do as you gather your intel and start getting some ideas and principles together is pull everyone together and be as transparent as possible and really kind of build up the morale. We're in this together. This is going to be a fight. It's going to be tough, but we're going to win it. And we're going to show, we're going to innovate to the point we'll teach other people how to do it and get people to <laughs> be curiously excited about what's about ha to happen rather than depressed and thinking that this would be the perfect time to retire and become a ski instructor in New Hampshire. And I think that's an important skill, right? Not all of us are great, inspiring communicators, right? And so as you're building your innovation team, finding that person that can really communicate with the group in a consistent manner and try to have, in my mind, a single person who is the source of truth, I think is really important as you outreach kind of your plans and what your goals are. Because I mean, as Rich said, panic and la lack of belief that people are being truthful to you is what will completely disintegrate the morale of a faculty. And so again, finding that person that writes the eloquent emails that aren't too long, but not too short, right? That appears approachable, that people can go to is really important. And it may not be you. It just may be somebody who works with you and that is fine. The main thing they want to feel that there's somebody in a leadership position that knows what they're going through, that has a rough idea of what's happening, so that they can trust in that and then focus on their part, you know, on the field. So what are some of the other angles that you have to worry about here? So we, we, we talked about innovation. So you, let's say you decide, gee, I want to give iPad in every room for example, and we're only going to, we're going to communicate and get histories with iPads, and the iPads are going to cost this much, and the CFO says, no, we can't afford that in our budget. So, uh, kind of can happen, right? What that speaks to is one of the keys of leadership starts long before the innovation and the crisis happens, which is you actually have to work and develop enough trust with your hospital administration that when you say, we need to spend this right now, they're not going to make it more complicated and make you jump through hoops. Yeah. And, if, and, then you, and that you know your hospital administration well enough that if you're dealing with a troll you know, in the CFO office, that you know, how, you know where the troll tamers are. And you can go to them and get them to get the guy under control and get you what you need. Yeah, I think what Rich is alluding to is a sphere of influence. Right, so if you kind of look about leadership, everyone kind of has their role, but everyone you talk to has a bunch of other people that they interact with. And so when you're developing this, especially if you're gonna do about finances, is really figure out that person that has the most and largest sphere of influence in the area that you want to be active in. If you're dealing with a hospital CFO, usually the CMO, right? Definitely has sphere of influence over that person. The CNO, another real powerful person that may have sphere of influence over that person. So building those relationships as you go is really important because it is your ability to kind of branch out and get the most people that will amplify your idea in the fastest way is what's gonna make your innovation be rapid. And again, that's really determining and thinking and being mindful about who you go to first and go to the person with the largest sphere of influence. And honestly, that's the person who during your leadership you need to make friends with, right? And you know, you need to talk to in the parking lot. You need to say hi to at lunch. You know, you need to read out, reach out to. And, and it, it sounds like it's hard. It's pretty easy to figure out who has a sphere of influence um, once you go start going to meetings. Yeah. 
when do you put out your capital? It's tough. Yeah, I, I think you have to realize that it's more of a market that you're going to be using up their capital as well. When you do favors to them, when you help them, when you make your department something that makes them look good, then you buy credit. And so, yeah. you know, again, you'll always be exchanging it. Secondly, um, the other sort of thing is that in a very nice way, you can blackmail them into uh, <laughs> good support, which means that you, you kind of in, in very supportive, positive emails, explain why if they say no, they'll probably be in jail by the end of the year or something like that. Um, you know, and, and, or at least by that I mean making sure that there's this general awareness of the problem, that people understand their ownership of their piece and that it is a team effort and that everybody on the team has to yeah. play. So for example, the iPads. I would never go in and say my faculty need the iPad so we don't get exposed, right? My biggest amplifier is gonna be the chief nursing officer and say, hey, look at you know what? We're really worried that nurses will get sick. And we think we can really be hopeful if the nurses observe the physician doing some histories, that way they aren't as exposed as much and we can limit their, how many times they have to go into the room, yeah. right? Getting that CND, which is right, this is, it's not about me, it's not for my guys, it's for you, right? Let me help you. And, and that person, for having had to live through this, was extremely powerful on getting exactly what we needed, which was not only just the iPads, but the entire infrastructure to do something like, uh, you know, we call them virtual visits in the ED. Now, right now, and, and by the way, the, the thing that the gentleman there mentioned in, in this situation in our department, we did all those things. And on top of that, we were able to get them to buy us a robot. Uh, how many people have gotten to have a robot in their ED? It's the coolest thing ever. I never got back, you know, rocket jets on my back, but I got a robot at least, so that was cool. Um, but there's another sort of thing that you have to anticipate what's going to be two moves away on the chessboard. You may run out of N95 masks, right? Even if you're doing, and we sent, we went down to MIT, for example, and said, start cooking us up a way we can build N95s in our basement. Uh, we stopped, we didn't get conned by the Chinese 10,000, you know, masks for five bucks sort of issue. But people were inventing masks. We were trying to innovate and in creating a flexible culture. But um, the other thing that's ticking is you are going to end up potentially in rationing. And PPE is one problem. The bigger one, obviously, here that we had in COVID will be ventilators. Um, so let me open that to you. You suddenly realize that in a week from now, you may not have enough ventilators for everybody that needs a ventilator in your institution. And that did happen certainly in New York and we came just under the wire in Massachusetts. And so how do you prepare for that and what are the sort of things you can do to innovate around that problem? I think I'll also throw a tw twist. You manage four different hospitals, right? And all of them are worried about being short on ventilators. <laughs> Don't we? Right? right? Nine for one. Nine. Yeah. <laughs> It's a real problem, and by the way, one we may be dealing with again and again. And people have just noticed uh, the latest shortage in IV contrast. This is going to be a recurrent problem. So, I mean, I think one of the things that crisis lets you do is think about why we do what we do, right? We learned from COVID that we shouldn't be innovating all these people, right? So our first thing was, our first thing was we're gonna do what we always do, and that actually exacerbated the shortness, the short of shortage of supplies, right? And made us really question why we do. So I think whenever you come across a crisis, one of the things is to challenge the dogma that you exist by. Is it the best thing for the patient? That's not quick. It takes time, but it takes you being willing to sit with people, right? And meet with your critical care folks, your pulmonary folks, and say, look, if we have limited resources, maybe it's not about the resources. What can we do on our practice? And I think that really advanced care by doing that. And frankly, I'm hoping that contrast is the same thing. We don't need IV contrast. The innovation with IV contrast right? is that we don't have it. That's just but great. It's awesome, right? <laughs> so uh, I'll give you an example of one move we made that ended up being a problem. So we decided that if we were going to run out, we had to be able to potentially decide who would get it and who wouldn't. Um, so there were two problems with that. The first is, how do you choose? The second one is, how do you prevent the provider who is caring for a patient from having to be the one making that decision because of the moral injury that would occur from that. And how do you deal with it when it gets leaked to the Dallas Morning Star that you were actually contemplating well, that? 
In, in fact, to give you the extreme example, faced with that problem in Italy, uh, a lady named Robert Roberta Pertinelli, who, who some of you may know as really the, the mother of emergency medicine in Italy, took on herself the right thing to be the one making that decision rather than giving it to her faculty. And when the dust settled after that first wave of COVID, they filed murder charges against her. So, you, you know, there are sort of extremes and you have to have a process that, that establishes it well. So, what would you guys do? I mean, how will you decide when you're there, ethically, you know, how you're going to create some way of saying this one lives and this one doesn't, or at least this one gets a vent and this one doesn't? Brian? Yeah, I So I'm agreeing 100% that you can't let the guy on the front line make the call and you need exactly that, a panel somewhat separate using some process that's been vetted and agreed to so that when it gets, the tires get kicked, it says, yeah, you had to use something. Um, here's, here's one of the problems though. So we, we went that line and then for example, what we did was we looked at because we really thought, looking at New York, that that wave may really substantially exceed it. So one thing we did, if you got four hospitals or nine hospitals or an entire city, build a network. Because it's going to hit probably by neighborhoods and by shuffling ventilators around and having everyone function as a system, you can make that sort of uh, wall to keep in that sort of tsunami a little bit higher. And now here's the error we made. We went ahead and used comorbidities ways that would be predictors of mortality to say, okay, it's better to give, if I have two guys, I'm gonna take the one who has the best chance of making it rather than the one who doesn't. And we thought that was quite great and we went ahead and put a nice score system on because we calculate all that data all the time. And what mistake did we make there? Yeah, Scott, correct. Well, the poor patients, in our neighborhood who definitely are predominantly patients of color, have less access to primary care, have a higher incidence of diabetes, renal disease, and things that are comorbidities, and yet we're disproportionately affected by the disease because it spread more easily in poorer neighborhoods where there was less ability to isolate and, and, and keep it contained. So when you're thinking about this sort of thing, you have to once again realize, are you really not only finding a 
an efficient system, but one that truly is fair and equitable. At the end of the day, we, we came up with the final innovation here, which was, does anybody remember the um, tsunami in uh, Thailand? So there's a thing called the Thai ventilator, uh, which is an endotracheal tube, an endo bag, a HEPTA filter, and a, and a family member. Uh, and you can ventilate a patient for quite some time until things opened up. So we literally basically had that ready to go. And when you do that sort of thing or go through that process now right from the start, it has a magic effect. Have you ever prepped a neck for a crike because you thought it might be difficult? You never have to crike them. It's only when you don't that you're scrambling for the equipment. That same magic effect admit works administratively as well if you prepare for it. It won't happen. You know, I think one of the caveats I'd add is that although we went through and we had a network for ventilators, my uh, UD Southwestern leadership was fighting for every ventilator they could find, right? So it's, it's we'll share, we'll share, we'll share, but right now, on day to day, it's me, 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 me. And so even mm. the best laid plans, everybody was in a way looks after yourself. So you have to have a little bit of cynicism in everything you do and think two steps down the road if you're really gonna be short because inevitably, Teamwork works really well in a competitive nature until somebody feels like they're getting, uh, they're getting screwed. I'd like to claim that's Massachusetts versus Texas, but <laughs> the fact is in Massachusetts, I think, uh, uh, Scott, you'll possibly remember in the early years when getting a pillow in the emergency department was impossibility. That's when I created my first black ops team to go steal them. I know. <laughs> and you can steal ventilators. Nobody guards ventilators. They're really easy to steal. <laughs> All right, should we go to the next yeah. case? All right, here we go, another, another thing. So this is something probably more current. The high cost of nursing, uh, at this point more expensive than an internist, and the lack of qualified nurses has reached a crisis stage at your institution. Along with ED crowding, you can only field 70% of the nurses you feel that you need to deliver safe care. The faculty are very angry because they've now been, been starting to assume a lot of the traditional roles filled by techs and nurses. Many are talking about resigning, and the more creative ones think it might be a wonderful idea to go talk to the newspapers. And by the way, I, I will quote Peter Rosen, who used to say that talking to the newspaper is like kissing your pet snake. You may think he loves you, but you will get a Absolutely. fat lip. In leadership, just I would 100% echo that. Journalists are never your friend because they write a perception, right? And so um, whenever you're asked to talk to them, just be a little mindful because they, uh, they have a different perspective and don't understand all the, all the things. All right, so what do we do here? So l l let's say faculty meeting is tomorrow morning and you're gonna have to tell the faculty why it's not a great idea for them to walk to that for-profit wonderful <laughs> place where they're gonna get paid more money and they have all the nurses they want. So what you're saying, which I think is a core principle to, to good leadership is, give everyone a voice. Yep. Tell them what the problem is and say, I wanna hear from you. Let's, how are we gonna solve this together? Uh, and this is a challenge, but our patients come for, and, and you know what? If you bring everything back to the patient for most doctors, that will actually engage them. Look, it's our patients who are most at risk here. We can't abandon them at this time of crisis. Let's work together to solve it. Agreed completely. Right. So, oh, so as I said, it's a really good point. I think one of the things to recognize is that every hospital and every emergency department deals has a different relationship with nursing. 
in that I know at UC Davis, nursing was part of under the umbrella of the department chair, right? So it was all one big happy family. Where I work now, completely separate, completely separate budgets, completely separate hire lines, can, you know, completely separate incentives. And so really understanding where you are when you go into this is really important uh, because it, it impacts how you can answer the questions and it impacts how much detail you know about the questions. So for me, like, like Dr. Singh said, I gotta bring in our nursing leadership or at least talk to them because I don't know their answers on what they're doing. Yeah, and I, I agreeing violently with both of you, I take it to a, a step further. Even if the budgets are separate, it's one family. You yeah. have to create what is a family atmosphere. So it starts long before the crisis has. So thinking about bringing in, if you're thinking about should I bring in the ED nurse director, you're probably already late in the game. That should have been right there up front. The nurses are yours as much as the doctors are in terms of the leadership component, of building morale, of making sure that everyone can trust in the, in the leadership. When we mentioned, for example, in the pandemic, who goes in and touches the patient, I would argue the smart move is to take turns and everybody takes a risk. And if you do that, nobody will say, this group is being favored over, over, over that group. So that was one of our first As long mistakes, as I don't have yeah. to go in, I, I really don't care. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, and that was one of our first mistakes at, at uh, one of our, our university hospitals where we set this up, is it was set up for the physicians. And immediately the nurses are like, what the heck, right? Why not us? And so I think you really have to think about the family attitude and what you're doing, how it impacts others. So we talked about looking at it as a team rather than just saying it's a nursing problem, how I fill the gap. Now, of course, you could just make it a nursing problem alone, say, let's innovate. Um, let's go poach them from some other country and let's let, let them have the problem instead. You know, that's been done many, many times in the past. Let's pay more money. Let's keep the price war going. Obviously not great in a long-term perspective, but it solves your problem. But are there other more innovative things that you could do here? Yeah. You guys, you guys pick or you want to arm wrestle? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I really mean it because I'm, I'm a real proponent of when, when things look like that are off. Can you use paramedics? Can you use tech and say, nurses do nurses in the middle of the lot, so it's a nurse and a patient, and instead of a nurse and four patients, it's a nurse and a paramedic and eight patients. Can you siphon the patients off? Can you input some new lines into that? Can you open up the urgent care or virtual urgent care to something like that and say, you know, we need to really be here in the waiting room And let's take that one further. So let's let's check the box. It solved your gap, you know, particularly if you can find people to do it. Would it be more cost effective? Substantially, right? So it means not only would you be solving your problem, but you'd be making your institution financially more competitive than others. So that CFO who's difficult suddenly thinks you're the greatest thing in the world. Where are the hurdles? Who's gonna, so in other words, you also, whenever you have an innovative idea, you gotta say, Who's going to be on my team who's and not. who's going to be blocking me? And then we could talk about how do you actually execute on that idea. So who do you think will be blocking that one? <laughs> Credentialing, they may be a problem, right? Because if those, you know, paramedics don't have the scope of practice, they work in some of the hospitals, so that may not be your biggest one. Legal. Legal? Legal. Good option. Oh, they might be worried about Brian, a malpractice yep, issue, right? Yep. Brian, yeah. the nurses. You're right, your biggest hurdle in this is probably gonna be your nurses. Because they don't want someone doing that role also, yep. right? Here's a fun question which I have asked at my, a bunch of my institutions. If you go up to a frontline nurse and say, is, if I could do a magic trick and you wouldn't have to do one task that you do routinely, what task would you want me to take away? And by the way, it's not moving bedpans. Seriously not, it's placing IVs. You know, you have to stick the patient, it's hard, it takes time. Uh, at least that's a consistent answer I've gotten. If you ask uh, the head of nursing, what is the one thing you, that they will not let you take away from the nurses, it's placing IVs. Uh, you know, because in other words, it's almost people are worried about protecting turf, yep. even to the point where it compromises mission. So our, our dean of U, UME got this great idea to say, look, at this poor class of 20, 
whatever that is, never see patients, mm -hmm. right? They've been stuck in COVID, haven't gotten into the hospital, everything's virtual. We're gonna give them the opportunity to go help the nurses. They can put IVs in and do vital signs. So we're gonna allow them to sign up so they can get clinical experience. Well, if anybody looks at Reddit, we got annihilated by the med students for they want us as free labor, right? And just completely all over Reddit on how bad UT Southwestern was on this. And it was done with a great intent, but we don't always understand or know how things will be perceived. And in this case, it was perceived very poorly. It got stopped in a week. As we were doing this exercise, you know, we said what do nurses don't want to do, and you said something really interesting, which is charting, which I agree with you, they shouldn't. But think about that. There's potential innovation right there. Why do they have to chart this much, particularly if there's a shortage and they cost this much money? All of that stuff should be figured out a way to be streamlined, shortened, or handed off to scribes, and maybe that's where we should be putting our scribes and having less nurse to close that gap. I love that attitude, right? Every crisis is an opportunity. And I think that that's kind of what you call about positive leadership, right? If you are going into this leadership and if every crisis you know, takes you down two steps and you feel really demoralized, it's gonna be really hard because there are little crises every day. And so I think that's one of the things that is important you already heard about wellness is every crisis lets you examine what you're doing and provides an opportunity to see what you can make better. Um, and I think that's a really important they need to keep in the back of your head because if you look at all these crises and look at its innovation as a chore, um, being a leader is really, really tough because that's a lot of what we end up doing. Now, I'd be curious, how many people are still routinely using lean processes in their department? Good, look, no hands. At one point, like it was state religion, I see, yeah, we're kind of shaking because there's yeah. some residual left from the state religion. Now. <laughs> The, the truth is that this is an actual place where those processes would work. Get the nurses on the front line, start mapping out the things that they do, start seeing if those things could be handled by a provider, set a general principle of everybody working to the le top level of their contract and work with credentialing and legal and nursing leadership saying, guys, we've got to solve this one because the patients, and again, always using the argument of the patient comes first is the way that very often breaks through those barriers of turf uh, and of basically uh, emotion. All right, last case. All right, something new that at least we're beginning to see. Overcrowding at tertiary institutions has created difficulty in accepting transfers from community hospitals. Emergency physicians in the community often have to call multiple times to find somebody willing to accept a dissecting aorta <laughs> Uh, or basically uh, a cancer patient, you know, with, with complex issues, neurosurgical case. Your own hospital is crowded, but you could possibly take some patients in the emergency department and board them and give them the care that they would need there, but you can't do it for everyone out there because there are just so many. Um, so that's the situation that, that you're in right now. And by the way, you're a tertiary institution, People are calling. A lot of these patients have had all their care there their entire life. Some of them, if you don't take them, are going to die, you know, where they are in the community. So you have an ethical issue as well. And uh, let's say some of your colleagues, um, looking across the room, uh, it's specifically one down there, sorry, um, are basically more reluctant or may not have the same threshold, or people have different thresholds. Or it's one of your friends, somebody you trained with calling you. Yes. Right. Or it could even be in your own network, uh, but you're jammed. Anybody dealing with this now? Okay, all right. So, and this problem, probably not going to get better right now. It's probably going to get worse. 
Yes. So that is exactly the right, f correct final solution, or one of them, which is it's not really a departmental problem or an institutional problem, it's a regional problem. And so you need, if it doesn't exist, <coughs> to begin to coordinate. Now very often, that coordination though, it's worked well in your state, in other states it's struggled because again, there's not an emergency medicine voice there, and there is a sort of blindness to what happens in terms of crowding on emergency patients in other areas. Uh, very often, uh, let's say, the procedural specialties, the CFOs, want elective. And emergency medicine for them is something that's gonna further hurt their bottom line, and that's how they lose their job, and unlike us, they don't have great job security. Yeah. And it should not even start by the time the patient gets in the hospital or should it even be started in pre-hospital, right? So if we can get the appropriate people to the right hospital, the transfer issues really aren't as big and that's one of the challenges we also face. But taking what you just stated, which I very strongly agree with and then extending it out, right? So on one hand, we're gonna take the guy on the front line out of the equation. On the other hand, what we're talking about is the very patient population that we are ethically required to protect being shortchanged potentially by that process. So where does the buck stop? Who has to be the one with the voice saying, I will not abandon these patients. I will not let this person because they don't have insurance, because they have mental illness, because of whatever, be abandoned uh, by the system. The answer is very often it's you. It is at that leadership level that you have to have the courage potentially at the risk of your own job, to go out and basically call it out, you know. Right. That's when you sneak in during discussions, hey, you know, I'm really concerned about systematic racism that we're introducing into this, Yeah. right? You know, that you just got to say the buzzwords, they kind of slide them in there so people actually, so they pause, right? Because you're never going to change their mind with what you say. They are going to have to, like you said, like the students, they're going to have to Black think male. about it. And black pill. But throwing in those key buzzwords that just will make somebody, it, you hope, inherently cringe, um, so they actually think about it from a different lens is really important. But what do you do at your own level? So now we've said that, but you're going to have to give rules. You may take it out, but what your faculty are going to need at some point are rules. You might have it deferred, but obviously some of these things have to be shot from the hip within a couple minutes. Right? Because if you say, oh, get, we'll get back to you in an hour on a dissecting order, that's not exactly ideal. So I can tell you what we decided or how we used it and, and have you guys critique it. So in our shop we said, if this is going to be a life-saving intervention and we can do it without dramatically compromising the care of the other patients in the department. And if it's true that doing that would compromise the other patients in the department, we should ask ourselves why we're not calling a disaster. Uh, that in other words, that if it's a life-saving thing, that we don't have any choice. Now the, the way you can get the institution on board is point out that someday the plaintiff bar is gonna figure out how to use EMTALA effectively, and this would be a wonderful place to pull that one. But the truth is, the reason to do it is because that's what we went into medicine for in the first place. So I, we talked about innovation. This is an area where I think we can be innovative, and I know there are some systems that are doing it, and 
I've talked to our CMO and said, look, at, if people are waiting for inpatient beds, right, we know it's, they should be direct admits, but there's no bed. Why don't we send a car that can do labs or imaging out to them and get things started, right? Then we could actually triage them, the ones who need to come into the ED to wait for a bed, ones who could wait for direct care. But why, if we know someone needs to be admitted, do we have to start their evaluation the minute they get to the hospital? So I think there is, talking about innovation, now that's gonna take uh, mountains to get going in my state uh, and you know, whole system, but just throwing it out there and seeing what sticks and saying, look, at, let's think about it differently. What can we do to help? We want to be part of the, pro the solution. But a perfect example that we were able to implement is getting neurosurgery teleconsults. Yep. Figuring out which intracranial bleeds really do need a tertiary center versus which can be managed locally. Uh, and that, and, and it's really looking at what, so it's not only what lives can we save, but what lives require that specialized care we deliver because if that's a precious resource, it has to be used wisely. Almost done. Great. Yeah. Yes. Lou had beliefs, which very much I share, which are not really integral to what I would say is the American healthcare system by a long shot. Uh, and if you want to, I mean, I've, I've written about this as well, but if you look at why do we have crowding, for example, uh, hey, it's no surprise how many admissions we need each year. I can probably predict that within about 0.5% a, a year ahead of time. I can almost do it day by day. Yet. I haven't had enough beds in years, and that's true for everybody. So why is that? It's a financial decision. Uh, if you can, it's just like airplanes overbooking because you fill every seat, and you fill the seat potentially with the, with the highest payer. That's not a public health system. That is a system that's based at ultimately on profit and on sort of eat what you kill, which at some point in this country we're gonna have to ask, is that really the way we want healthcare to be? Um, but the problem is, I, I agree, that's how it should be. But unfortunately, we have to try and make that happen in a system that's not designed to do that. Just made people more greedy for what the money, the, the profitable procedures. So, Harinder, I, I, I mean, as you know, for example, in the AECM, in that task force, that's, or during those meetings, those are exactly the ideas. We're realizing, I, I think I calculated now there are about 250 peer review publications on all the problems, causes, and consequences of crowding. So the science isn't changing it. That part, that part's clear. The advocacy that we're doing in our own institutions is not changing it. That part is eminently clear. So the only way we are going to change it is by giving our patients a voice mm -hmm. so that CMS hears it, so that the American, you know, basically all the societies that represent the elderly hear it, so that we give a voice to the mentally ill, which are probably treated in a way that hasn't been seen since the Middle Ages, and so that we begin to raise awareness at the public level. Uh, I believe a couple of days ago there was an article in the, the New York Times about a young person who had been trapped in an ED <laughs> with mental health issues for days. Oh, what a surprise that was, <laughs> front page, <laughs> right? So, but somehow that's important because until we get that level of awareness and until there's actually a political will to make the change, I, I don't think anything is gonna change it. I think it's gonna be partnering with patient groups that is gonna drive it. Doctor groups complained about their yeah. workload. 
never has gotten anywhere, but getting some strong patient advocates is kind of what we need. I mean, well. problem is we see it's not working we know it and s many CEOs Mary I can look at you on this one think that's perfect a perfect sign that it's working exactly the way they want to right. sorry So I, I was bashing on the American health care system, uh, but the truth is crowding is a first world problem. Yep. And I think it boils down to the actual origin behind the economics, which is political voice. Who gets harmed by, and who crowds, and you'll find it's usually the constituents that have the least voice in the society. And secondly, I would have bet Irish accent, not Australian, but. Right. Right. Well, on that positive note, um, yeah, we'll have to close, yeah. We're going to have to wrap up. Thank you so much. Great.